Um, ooh, hope that's not too loud. Okay. Um, I'm carrying these things around because, like, silly me, I didn't put anything on with pockets. So I'm all trussed up here. Hopefully I won't drop anything. Um, I first became involved in studying the history of French Canadians in the Champlain Valley on the other side of the lake. I was interested in Plattsburgh. Um, I worked on a project where we looked at the murder of a, an individual from Plattsburgh by a French Canadian. And it was fascinating to me for a number of thing, reasons, one being when I started looking at the documents and the information about Plattsburgh, none of the official histories really talked about French Canadians at all. And I knew that there were lots of French Canadians living there. So then I went back and looked at the census and found that in fact, almost 65% of the population of the city was indeed French Canadian, many of whom had been born in Canada or their parents had been born in Canada. So the absence of French Canadians in the historical record was really interesting to me. And that kind of launched a larger uh, look at how immigrants in particular, French Canadians um, are uh, often ignored and sometimes completely erased from the historical record for various reasons, uh, usually because they tended to be, especially in the 19th century, they tended to be at the bottom of the social register, so to speak. And because of that, they were considered of no consequence, unless you were an employer who needed to have cheap labor, then they were very important. So. Uh, that's kind of how I got started in this. And then in um, 2009, with the quadricentennial, I was asked to um, prepare a presentation on French Canadian um, people in the Champlain Valley. And uh, uh, what you will see today is the result of that plus the year since more things that I've both uncovered as well as begun to talk about in terms of how, uh, what I've learned about French Canadian, the French Canadian history in this region. So I called this windmills and garden plots originally because the windmills were a complete surprise to me and the garden plots imply more than just soldiers being here in the Champlain Valley, even in the early years. Um, uh, Phoebe's extraordinariness um, as a woman is not just something that she owns, owned alone. There were lots and lots of French Canadian women who here, were here, who, who lived and, and who helped to develop families and communities, and often their place was the garden plot. So uh, I added them to the, the uh, title indirectly, um, as women are often referred to anyway. So I think everybody probably agrees that the first, first French person in the Champlain Valley was Ch Samuel de Champlain. Champlain was part of a major effort on the part of France to penetrate the North American continent. They were not interested necessarily in settlement in the same way that the English were or that the Spanish were. Instead, what they were really interested in is finding a way across the continent so that they could get to the Pacific and go to the Far East, which was their target. And so they spent a lot of years searching for what they called the Northwest Passage. And that meant exploring every riverine system. Um, and I have this kind of imagine, imaginary um, video that plays in my head where Champlain, who speaks French, is speaking to native guides who might speak a kind of rudimentary 
French, but probably not very well, and him saying that he's looking for the ocean, and they get the idea that he's looking for a big body of water, and they say, oh yeah, in that direction, right? And so um, explorers like Jacques Cartier, who explored the mouth of the St. Lawrence, and then um, following upon him uh, 70 years later or so, um, you have Champlain, and they're exploring the countryside, looking for that elusive Northwest Passage, which in fact never existed. But along the way, they discover, and I use that term advisedly, they, they open the, the um, hinterland to uh, exploration by French um, explorers as well as others who are interested in this interior. And uh, men like Champlain did a lot of this. They made maps. And at first the maps were very rudimentary, but, um, but they became, quickly became very, um, very carefully drawn. And in fact, some of the maps that were drawn in the 17th, 16th and 17th century um, are as accurate as any map that you would find today. So they did a lot of that work. So this is, one of the old maps that I came across, and uh, it was drawn by Samuel D. Champlain. And what I want to point out to you is that he had a fairly good idea of uh, what was happening in the opening and down the St. Lawrence, the Saguenay, um, and of course, the connections with the Richelieu River or the Sorel, however, you, there's several names it gets known by, um, connects Lake Champlain and then eventually the um, greater extent of the riverine system of the St. Lawrence River. Um, and Champlain was hoping that he could at least convince the French to, the French monarchy to establish settlements along the St. Lawrence, beginning in Quebec and eventually um, passing down uh, to the bottom of, of the uh, very navigable portions of the St. Lawrence River, um, and that those um, settlements would become important points uh, both of exploration, but also connecting to the other uh, part of um, France's interest in this part of North America, and that's the fur trade. So the French are incredibly invested in both the fur trade and fishing, and so that's one of the reasons why this whole region here becomes much uh, becomes very very interesting to them. Um, they're they're fishing off of the Grand Banks, they're fishing in these regions here, and the fur trade, which is primarily at the beginning happening between native people who are bringing their furs for trade and um, the, the um, uh, trading posts, if you were, the rudimentary trading posts that are trading for those furs. Again, I always have this kind of 30 second video that plays in my head about the whole beginning of the fur trade. One of the um, reasons why beaver fur becomes so popular in the period of Champlain's exploration and afterwards is because of fashion. Um, the creation of beaver hats. And um, Indian people liked beaver for, for clothing, for winter clothing. And so often what they would do is they would have a fresh pelt that they would turn the skin side in, I'm sorry, the skin side out and the fur side in, and they would wear their pelts all winter long. And the process of the chafing of the pelts against their skin and the moisture of human sweat and the grease that they use to keep their skin warm and protected um, felted the beaver skins. In the spring, the, um, the native people discarded those winter clothes. They were only good for one season because the guard hairs had been felted off and the underneath had been completely felted flat. And so um, what they might have used the skins for before Europeans began to try and snap them up is to cut them and use them as um, pieces of, of leather or some 
form of, of other um, activity. When the Europeans saw the felted beaver skins, they were completely fascinated with the fact that they didn't even have to go through the process of felting the skins. They could buy them already felted. So in, in that part, in, in, in that 30 second video that I play in my head, I can imagine an Indian man or woman with his pile of discarded winter clothing that they aren't really gonna use for anything important, um, suddenly having that be an important trade item to Europeans. And so, you know, there's this oft, often this um, kind of um, condescending uh, discussion about Manhattan being sold for beads. But in this case, it's sort of the reverse. It's like, copper pots and really uh, and, and metal hatchets and knives and things that Indian people wanted were being traded to them for things that they no longer wanted. So it's a really interesting reversal. So the French are deeply embedded in this whole region in the fur trade and that um, activity of the fur trade pushes the boundaries of exploration outwards. Um, Champlain, in some of his explorations, is going to then set up another um, element of French-Canadian uh, and French uh, tradition in the Champlain Valley, and that is a long-standing feud with the Iroquois, most specifically the Mohawks. When Champlain was exploring Lake Champlain, um, he, and, and there's a lot of debate about exactly where this happened, but he was traveling with a group of guides who were likely Abnaki or Algonquian peoples. And at one point they, um, they stopped in this, uh, so some historians have placed this encounter near where the, the uh, Fort Crown Point is. Um, others have it a little bit further north near Split Rock Point. Um, it's not really certain, but it, what is certain, it was about halfway down the lake and it was on the west side of the lake. Um, and Champlain and his guides uh, stopped, went ashore uh, from the canoes, and they were met with a group of Mohawk men who were there uh, probably because they heard that there was this exploration going on. They wanted to, more than likely, wanted to make contact with Champlain. Um, they themselves were involved in the fur trade, so there's all sorts of reasons why they would have wanted to meet. Champlain decided that he was going to, um, how do I put it, demonstrate the strength and the um, utility of the Europeans as allies to his Algonquian um, friends, and the way that he intended to do that was to use his gun, or rather have one of his two soldiers that were traveling with them use their gun. And so they set up their blunderbuss. Now, these are not rifles, right? They're long guns that are muskets. They're uh, loaded, they're muzzle loaded. They're very loud. They are completely inaccurate. And they're more of a, um, how do I describe this? More of a, a, a shock and awe item than they are a deadly weapon, so to speak. But he has his Indian people, his Indian guides kind of sh shield him, and then at the last second, he has them step aside and the two guns are fired. And in fact, um, at least one and perhaps two of the Mohawk men who were there um, in this greeting ceremony were, were uh, hit and knocked down by um, the firing of the weapons. Champlain was intending to demonstrate his worthiness as an ally for his, his uh, Algonquian neighbors, but inadvertently, or perhaps without a whole lot of care, he also set up the situation where the Mohawks are never really going to trust or uh, engage very much uh, on a regular basis with the French. Now, in addition to explorers coming into the, the region, you also have the um, activities of missionaries who are um, going out to the various Indian groups. Uh, most of these men were Jesuits. 
Um, their activity was intended to spread the faith, um, and uh, Isaac Schultz is, is one of those uh, uh, missionaries who became very famous. At one point, he was um, taken captive by um, the Iroquois and tortured. This is something that I think a lot of people, I know when I try to explain it to my students, it's really difficult for them to understand, but there, is a, there was a great deal of um, emphasis on the dignity of the warrior. And one of the things that warriors uh, were expected to do was to resist calling out from pain. And the longer that you resisted and the more stoic that you were, demonstrated how great a warrior you were. The Jesuits figured this out pretty quickly. And so they understood ritual torture. And so Jogues was ritually tortured and they in fact um, ruined his hands in the process. He went back to France and actually asked for a dispensation from the Pope to allow him to say mass, even though his fingers had been mutilated, um, which that was given to him. So he actually was able to uh, continue saying mass, but he also came back to North America where eventually he was martyred. And I think to a certain extent, this is my opinion, but I think I'm not too far off on this, The uh, efficacy of martyrdom in this process of trying to convert Indian people to uh, Catholicism remained a really important emphasis among a lot of these Jesuit priests. But along with the missionizing, they also explored. And between um, the, the uh, missionaries, the uh, voyagers who began to travel the backcountry hunting for furs, and the explorers, the French, um, extended their reach in North America. Now, this does not mean that there were French living in this whole region, but it does give you a sense of the extent to which their explorations and their claims to North American territory uh, were, as far as they were concerned, were established. Now, in some places, there were actual um, communities. You can see the stars kind of set this up. Um, these are primarily trading posts and small communities. Um, beyond the, um, these trading posts, the French also buried these lead plates in the ground to mark their boundaries. So there was a, an effort to say, this is our territory. Um, but that effort um, really um, was an effort of exploration and claims and not so much settlement, okay? So, by the period of the, the mid-18th century, the French had explored and the concentration of settlements that had taken place mainly were around the um, St. Lawrence River, down to Montreal, um, and down the Sorel, and, or how, whatever name you want to use for that river, um, and also into the Champlain Valley. The uh, major fortifications in the Champlain Valley were St. John, uh, the Fort St. Anne on Isle of Mott, and Fort St. Frederick down uh, where Crown Point is, exists today. And those fortifications were primarily established for, um, to, to protect the French claim to this area, which they viewed as New France, um, and to um, prevent the English and the Dutch from coming north and west into the territory that they claimed. So, because the, the, um, the English settlements in New England, as well as the Dutch settlement in New York, they were pressing forward and were, to a certain extent, competing with the French. So there wasn't, uh, uh, the French wanted to prevent uh, too much in the way of land grab by either uh, group. The primary group of people who, the soldiers who, who were um, 
stationed at places like St. John and, and Saint Fort St. Saint Anne and Fort St. Frederick were from the Carignan Salier uh, Regiment. And um, one of the things that is really fascinating about this whole process of putting these forts in place and uh, then establishing them with garrisons is there is a kind of backhanded effort on the part of the French authorities to also get people to settle. If you were a member of that regiment and decided to retire and you agreed to retire in North America, the, the king would grant you land and he would also give you labor and years provisions and a variety of other um, uh, things to to get you to stay. So that was one of the ways in which um, the s French settlement begins to really take hold, hold and become much more permanent uh, in the region. And so some of the French who, who live around the region, especially in the, this area as well as this area, are in fact retired soldiers who then move with their families onto these plots of land and begin to uh, live there as part of the sort of greater communities that surrounded these fortifications. So again, the French were really trying to um, create a series of a chain of forts, if you will, and protective garrisons to keep the French from uh, coming north, and so you can see down the St. Lawrence and down the Sorel and then into Lake Champlain and actually down to Lake George, there's a whole series of uh, these kinds of fortifications and encampments that are intended to repel English, uh, by this time, by the, the uh, mid 17th century English incursion into this region. Um, I included a bunch of maps because I like maps, but also I think it's really important to get a sense of how the, the, the shape of the maps change over time as people become more and more and more familiar with the, the territory. So if you compare this map, it's made in 1732 with a much earlier map, you can see that Lake Champlain's contours are much more like what we understand them to be today, not to mention the placement of the islands and the various landforms around the lake, including the mouths of rivers and, and so on. So the French got to know the valley very, very well before the English uh, ever arrived. So, one of the places that really kind of um, fascinated me when I started to look very closely at uh, French Canadian settlement in the Champlain Valley is the, uh, both the creation of Fort St. Frederick and the um, creation of communities that surrounded it. So today, if you go to Crown Point historic site on the New York side of uh, Lake Champlain, there's uh, a museum and a campground. And if you walk around the campground, you can see historic markers that say, this is where the village was located, and this is where the gardens were located. And so there's a lot of really good historical markers there. At the time that the French established Fort St. Frederick, the point of establishing it here was because it was guarding one of the narrowest um, areas of the lake towards the south. So this fort was created to protect against invasion from the south. And um, it was a, uh, a stone star fort. In fact, remnants of it can be seen if you cross over the bridge at Crown Point you can, and you look, you're going from east to west and you look down to your right, you can see the points of the ends that still exist. Um, they also created a series of other um, stone and wood supports that uh, were intended as sentry posts and also uh, places to, to um, launch cannon and so on in the case of an assault. So it was a pretty articulated site along with the small communities that grew up around it. And across the lake, on the Vermont side, there was actually the remnants of a, of an, a much earlier uh, wooden fort that had uh, been sort of the base camp as they were um, beginning to build and, and develop Fort St. Frederick. And again, more community grew up around that as well. So there was a 
fairly substantial French community that lived there um, as a part of this um, larger effort to get the French to settle in the region. This is uh, an artist's mock-up of what that fort uh, on the Vermont side would have looked like. Um, they, when they replaced the, the um, bridge at Crown Point, they found the foundations of this wooden fort and mapped it. And so that's how we know the shape and the placement of the fort. So, so when I started looking at Fort St. Frederick, one of the things, first things that really hit me was this huge windmill. And I thought, really, a windmill? Why would you build a windmill at a fort? That doesn't make sense to me. Until I realized that for the French, this was the, the um, standard way for grinding grain. The English and New Englanders liked running water and they liked locating their mills along streams and, and, um, or created dry mills with ponds and so on, but they used water power. But the French tended to use air or wind power. And so um, what I discovered as I began to, to um, explore this deeper is that the windmills uh, served several purposes um, one really important purpose is to grind grain, right? You have to have grain ground into flour or you can't make bread. And Europeans love their bread. And so uh, that was a really important aspect, which says that this is not a fort that's being supplied by someplace else. It's supplying itself. It's growing its own food, it's growing its own wheat, and, and so on. So the windmill fascinated me and then I came across the original building's um, uh, plans for that particular windmill. And I realized a couple of things. One, it was stone. And secondly, it was more than just a windmill. It was also a fortified blockhouse. So if you were, if, 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 English raiders or Indian raiders or somebody that was a danger to you showed up, you could withdraw inside the windmill and be protected. There were slits so that you could fire out of the windmill, but you were protected inside the windmill. And some windmills were actually built with, with um, crenellations on the top where you could mount cannons and, and so on. So these were, uh, Things, these were buildings that were meant for domestic use, but they were also meant for, for protection and for military use as well, which I found incredibly fascinating. Um, and then I started looking to see if you could find other windmills. So there's this one at Crown Point. What, you know, where else could they have been? And I realized that in Quebec, they're all over the place. I'd never looked for them, but they're all everywhere. And in fact, I found a map where you can visit something like 20 of them, um, and all along where the major settlement of uh, French Canadians uh, established themselves. Um, but I also found that there were at least three windmills in, uh, or on Lake Champlain. So we know about the one at uh, Fort St. Frederick, but there was also one that was destroyed, but was near Burlington Bay, probably on this point here. And there was a windmill uh, that is, uh, the remnants of that windmill were, were um, were there all the way up until after the American Revolution and the windmill sat close to where the um, lighthouse at, uh, at Alberg on, on Windmill Point. So there were at least three. And I don't know if anyone has really done a concerted effort at looking for more, there could have been more, but the fact that there were three windmills on the lake serving French people who are living and uh, uh, creating lives here, I think says something about the determination of the French and then later the French Canadians to, um, to stake their claim to the Champlain Valley. The other thing that you see in this map are the um, seigneurial grants that were made to 
uh, French aristocrats, or at least the better sort of people, whose job it was to attract settlers. And in fact, part of the contract that established these, these grants required the building of a, lot of a windmill. So again, you know, it's one of those things that I, I hadn't really thought a great deal about, but it's clear that, they're, um, that they were very important to the development of the region. Now, oh, I think I'll go back to this map first before I'll talk a bit about this. So what happens to all of this? Well, um, there's a kind of mythology that once the French and Indian War happens, the French people leave the Champlain Valley and that's it. And it's not true. Yes, people pulled out of the way of the war, so did the English people. Um, so did Indian people for that matter. There were substantial Indian populations living in the Champlain Valley at the same time. So no one wants to be in the way when an army comes marching onto your front lawn, right? And um, so, so homesteads were abandoned. Ro um, Rogers Rangers burnt homes and barns and killed livestock at, uh, as they attacked the French. So there's a lot of damage to French communities, but not every single French family left. And some of those who left came back. So there's evidence that, for instance, uh, You've all heard of Mallet's Bay. Well, Mallet was not English. His name was actually Mallet, and he was a Frenchman who refused to move even when Ethan Allen tried to force the issue. So you have French people living in this region, you have a lot of French people living in this region, and you still have some French people living down here. So, um, so despite the fact that the French and Indian War ends French control, French royal control over the region, it doesn't end French occupation um, and French community in the region. Although it, I would argue it does shrink it, obviously. So who are these people that stay behind after the French and Indian War is over? Um, they are popularly known as habitants, um, which basically translates to peasant farmers. They lived on strips of land that get divided out of the seigneurial grants. Um, and it's fascinating, they were quite ingenious in the way in which they planned both their settlements and uh, made arrangements for future generations. This is a satellite map of a portion of the St. Lawrence River. And you see all these little strips? Those are habitant farms. You can still see the evidence of the settlement even today, which I think is fascinating. But what I would point out to you, here's the genius of it. The first generation of people would have settled right on the river. And those strips, they would have had to cut trees and clear land and bring land under cultivation and all the rest of it. So there was a lot of work for that first generation. When the second generation of, of sons need to be settled, guess what? You create a second row. Here's a, here's a road here. A third generation, here's another road. Here's another road. In other words, you can just keep pushing back the tree line and you can keep bringing land under cultivation for each success, successive generation of people. And that's exactly what they did. So it was a really long time before they, for want of a better phrase, ran out of land to settle their families on. Oops, I don't want to move to that yet. So I want to go back to the map for just a second. So at the end of the French and Indian War, the English are now in control. In fact, Canada is a British colony. It's known as Lower Canada. Um, it kind of goes back and forth between Quebec and Lower Canada. Um, English people are brought in, but the French, or I'm sorry, the British authorities agree to allow the French Canadians who live along the St. Lawrence Valley 
to retain their land, much to the chagrin of the Americans who were uh, British colonists at the time and who were looking lustfully at all of this wonderful land that could be open to them. And given what happened earlier at, um, when Acadia became Nova Scotia, there was a belief among some that the, the uh, British authorities would just gather up the French and ship them off to wherever they would ship them off. And so um, essentially, uh, that the hope was that that would happen. But in the proclamation of 1763, George III said, okay, we're gonna allow the French to stay on their land. We're going to allow them to continue to practice their Catholic religion. And we are going to uh, presume that they are citizens of the British Empire. Now, there was some discussion about whether French people would be asked to take oaths of loyalty um, and uh, uh, sort of prove the fact that they weren't going to be a sort of um, fifth column within the country. But uh, for the most part, that wasn't really um, employed very, very much. And so for habitants, life went on pretty much as usual. What happens to push them, uh, or rather push their descendants, their fourth and fifth and perhaps sixth generation descendants out of this um, pattern and out of this valley is two, are two things. One, the land basically runs out. You can't push further and further into the, into the countryside. You've reached the limits of, of the, the uh, major uh, kind of, of development that farmers needed to do. And so that means that French Canadian children and grandchildren have to find another way to make a living. Now, among the English, this had happened a little bit earlier than it did for the French, but this exodus out of the country and into urban areas was triggered by this need to find another way to make a living. At the same time that this happens, there's another major change in how people are going to make their living and survive, and that is the industrialization process that's beginning to take hold, especially in Northeastern United States. By 1830, you have railroads, you have a whole variety of, of developments that are happening, and most particularly the development of mill towns that need labor. And the, the employers of those mill towns are sending out recruiters, if you will, sometimes they called them slavers, with wagons, literally going out into the countryside trying to gather up people to come and work in the factories. They first concentrate on women, but eventually they're, they're going to bring in whoever they could bring in. And talking about mill girls is probably something I should do another day. But the idea is that French Canadians were now attracted into the United States because of um, a couple of uh, factors, a big one being employment. Another one being the fact that they had relatives and connections with French Canadians living in the United States already. At the end of the American Revolution, for instance, there was a huge concentration of French Canadians living here who had basically moved from Canada to the United States side of the border because they'd supported the American troops in the invasion, in the failed invasion of 1775. So there's lots of French people that are living in this region. There's also, um, as the mills begin to develop across Maine and down into Massachusetts and, and uh, various areas of Vermont and Northern New York, so too did uh, these new migrants. So I think of this as a kind of second wave of French Canadian immigration into the country. The first one being the early French, the second one being this wave. And then in fact, if you carry it forward and you look at the 20th century, you can find there's a third wave that happens in the middle of the 20th century as well. And if most, most of you live here in St. Albans, no? Vermont? Okay, so you know that until recently, the border was a very porous 
thing. People went back and forth, lived back and forth, farms spanned the border. Uh, my daughter-in-law is from Montreal. I mean, this is something that's very common for this region. And so this going back and forth really encouraged French migration into the region. Now, some of them came to be loggers, some of them came to be miners, some of them came to be uh, guides in the Adirondacks, some of them came to work in the mills, many of them came to work in places like Winooski, uh, St. Albans, Manchester, Burlington, Plattsburgh, all, all the places where mills really began to proliferate. And the, they, um, between 1830, here's my factoid, between 1830 and 1930, roughly 100 years, almost a million people relocated to the United States from Quebec. Now, some of them didn't intend to stay, but sometimes your intentions don't necessarily get carried through. Some did come and make money and then go back home to Quebec, but the larger number of them actually stayed. Um, and you can find evidence of this all over New England and, and upstate New York with the creation of Little Canada's. If you look at maps, um, especially um, if you look at census um, recordings that have street names on them, you can find whole neighborhoods that are all French Canadian. Um, I read a letter once that was written by a young woman that was um, part of the first class that attended Plattsburgh Normal School. And she took the train from um, uh, somewhere down around Whitehall. She took the train into Plattsburgh. And when she got off the train in Plattsburgh, she thought she'd overshot the border because everybody around her was speaking French. <laughs> Until the 1950s, a lot of public schools as well as private schools taught French at least half a day uh, because so many of the children came to school speaking only French. Uh, women tended not to be bilingual as often as, as men were. Men needed to be bilingual in, in order to engage in uh, outside uh, ac uh, economic activity. Um, a lot of these little Canadas had their own everything, their own undertaker, their own grocer, their own butcher, their own, you name it. It was, it was uh, it, their own churches. Well, in fact, churches that subdivided ethnically. Um, so I, I'll tell you one more story before I stop and then you can ask questions. Um, in my study of Plattsburgh long ago, I discovered that the uh, French church, St. Peter's, um, had been built at a time when the Diocese of Albany was just about to subdivide. Now, the Catholics of Platts were, were both Irish and French Canadian, were all attending the, the Catholic Church, which was this little wooden building that had been donated to them by Henry Delord many, many years before. And uh, when the, the uh, rumors of this new subdivision of the diocese was about to take place, the Irish, who had done pretty well economically, uh, they didn't quite have the, the language barrier that the French Canadians had, decided that they were going to help their fellow French Canadians build their own church. <laughs> and so there was a great deal of um, uh, money raising and the masons of the community and, and people came from Quebec and they raised St. Peter's. Beautiful church. And as soon as that was done, the Irish turned around and marched back to St. John's, tore it to the ground and built a basilica and waited. But the bishop never came because they decided to see the, the new the subdivision they decided to seat the new bishop in Ogdensburg. So the Basilica of St. John the Baptist is not a basilica, it's a parish church, but it was, in fact, intended to be a basilica. So the, kind of sad, really, in a way. Um, but the saddest thing for me was recently I heard that the um, Catholic community of Plattsburgh is actually remerging. And so the three Catholic churches, um, Our Lady of Victory, St. John's, and St. Peter's are all going to uh, merge again, and uh, there won't be ethnically 
uh, diverse churches in uh, Plattsburgh anymore. So that kind of signals, uh, I think, the end of an era when um, ethnicity and language, uh, because the, the central problem that French Canadians had uh, with going to church with Irish Catholics is they wanted a priest who spoke French. And um, for a long time, they had to actually go uh, and get a dispensation from their bishop in Albany to bring a priest from Quebec because the priests who were coming from Albany and New York were in fact Irish. So that kind of uh, has gone by the wayside now, which is a little bit sad. So um, this map shows you the concentrations of French, but I would suspect that um, we, you know, in areas like where we are now, 40% uh, 40, uh, 40 of, of the population is French Canadian and perhaps even French speaking. So, so it's a really fascinating and rich history. It's affected everything. It's affected uh, place names, it's affected food ways, it's affected a whole variety of our cultural background, religion, uh, and so on. And so um, the French have, the French Canadians especially have contributed a great deal to the culture and society of, of our communities around Lake Champlain. Thank you. So um, I think I have one more slide. I, I, these are the mill, this, this is actually a group of mill workers. Um, this is a portion of the efficient force that keeps the wheels turning. And these were, according to the person who took the photograph, um, these were primarily French Canadians. Um, this is uh, a young man whose last name is Baudoin, and he was in Winooski, and then um, these two girls I believe were in a cotton mill in southern Vermont. Um, this little girl, I think, uh, was French. So, questions? Yes? I understand that Parisian French and Quebec French differ quite a bit. Um, is it, was there a reason for that, or just, just a natural evolution? Well, Okay, so here's what I would say about French. Having had my knuckles wrapped when I was in convent school for not having the proper accent, I know this very well. Um, first of all, Parisian French is just that, Parisian French. Even in France, you find different uh, dialects in the same way that you find different dialects here in the United States. Try going to Selma, Alabama and talking with someone and understanding everything or having them understand you. It's, the, it's a very similar sort of thing. Some of this is related to isolation. Some of it's related to the way in which language naturally change. Um, the uh, French in Quebec was exposed to Indian languages, was exposed to uh, Dutch languages, was exposed to uh, French, or I'm sorry, English language. So naturally there's going to be some evolution of, of linguistic change. Um, and, and partly it's sort of an island too, in the sense that it's not having direct and regular contact with France. But it also depends on where you are in Quebec as to what accent you're going to hear. So for instance, if, if you are um, south of Montreal and you go to uh, La Cadie, uh, St. John, uh, there's a couple of communities there, the language that you're going to hear is more um, like the language you would have heard in Acadia because Acadians settled those communities after the dispersion of 1733. Um, North, you're going to hear more of the kind of Norman French that uh, is part of the northern part of France, and that's because most of the French Canadian settlers, their ancestors, were more northern and western. So, so the short answer is yes, it is different, but it is not different in any sort of un. Uh, toward way it just is different because of the the circumstances and and also the geographic um, effects that it has. Other questions? Yes. You mean here in the room? Yes. 
How many of you have French ancestry? Okay, so that's about right, statistically. You know, first of all, it depends on how long your family's been in the valley too, right? So there's, there's that element as well. But uh, what I would say about that is that I know in my father's generation, there was still some stigma associated with being French Canadian. And so families often just suppressed that knowledge simply in the same way they suppressed knowledge about having Native American heritage is because it was just dangerous. You, you wanted to fit in, you wanted to be part of the economic and, and social world that, that was the 1950s and 60s. And so, you know, some people just didn't know. I knew because when we went to my grandparents' house, no one spoke English. Everyone spoke French. So it was like, if you wanted to know. I mean, I, at first, my mother, I, I'm the product of a mis, mixed marriage. My mother was an Anglo, right? So um, in, in our household, we spoke English. But in my grandmother, in my father's um, household, they spoke French. Well, it always fascinated me um, as a child. But the first French words I learned were swear words because they were the ones that I heard, right? It was when my father was in the garage changing a tire and slipped and, and slapped him up, you know? And so it's like, oh, here's a French word, right? And of course, my brothers and I thought that was hilarious that we would, you know, learn the, the bad words first. Not that we knew anything about what they meant, but we knew they were bad because my mother would say, Raymond, stop it, you know, so, you know, um, but, but eventually, of course, being able to, you know, spending time at my grandparents and, and my aunts and uncles and so on, and you just, you almost have to pick it up, and kids are good at that stuff, but then I went to school, and uh, in school, my, the French nuns who, who taught our convent school were very correct, spoke Parisian French, and, you know, it was like, no, 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 not, that's not the way you say it. Sort of, sort of thing, so, yeah, so they kind of scared it out of me for a while. Yes? This is more of a comment, but the present economic transfer between uh, the countries and, and a lot of traveling that goes back and forth is a health I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last word you said. Is, is health care? Yeah, oh, absolutely, absolutely. Can you repeat the, when somebody says something, can you repeat? Sure. He was observing that there's a lot of cross-border health care activity that takes place. Um, other questions or comments? Yes? Where was that mill? Did you know it was the town? That's in Burlington. Oh, it is Burlington. Yes, that's Burlington. She wanted to know where that mill was. Oh. Yep, that particular photograph I um, took from the UVM um, geographical website. They've got a wonderful website that shows pictures from the past and pictures from the present, if the buildings or the landscape is still the same. And, uh, and, and that one was, was um, entitled French, French Canadian Workers, so that was why I grabbed it, because I thought that it was interesting that the, um, the, the photographer noted that they were French people, but in, but in this um, caption, it doesn't at all. So, once again, kind of an invisibility. So, yes. Um, you commented about the mines and the logging, but at what period did the French Canadians come who came to farm? We had a friend who, if he were alive, would be 100, and his family came sometime before the war way down to south of Virgins, Waltham, that area. Yes. And, and of course up here, there's mm -hmm. all kinds. And my husband's family actually is part of that migration. Um, and that begins in, during the Depression and continues on into the 1940s. There's a, there's a big relocation of, of um, French Canadian farmers who, who come into Vermont, and in particular, Addison County. Um, there were a number of property owners who wanted to sell their land and they sponsored French-Canadian uh, migration in. 
So my, my husband's father was 13 when his family uh, came across the border and, and settled their farm in Waltham, actually. Oh, yeah. So. What was the name? Willette. O U E L L E T T E. What, what uh, branch do you come from? That's my, that's my husband's name. Okay. My name, my maiden name was Poland. And uh, my French Canadian uh, connection came at the time of the American Revolution. My ancestor was a soldier in the 1st Canadian Regiment and then the 2nd Canadian Regiment. I'm sorry? Yes, Antoine, exactly. And um, I'm descended from Pierre, Antoine's son, Pierre. So does your husband know what's branched let's see Jason All I know is that they're from Moose Creek. Where? Moose Creek in Quebec. That's all I know. I don't know more than that. I've asked, but everyone says, oh, why do you want to know that? <laughs> That's old stuff. But there are, there are many Willettes in Quebec. Yeah, then that's spelled it with O U I. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I don't know why it was the original spelling and that the wisdom and the was in it were anglicized for Yeah, that's one of the things that happens. Census takers um, have a lot to answer for. They, they, <laughs> they murdered a lot of French names. Um, and in fact, often the best source for the original spelling is the um, French priests who recorded them properly. So often you can, it, it isn't perfect, but often you can go back to the French records and find. Yeah, census, census workers would have been interviewing French, or they would have been hearing it with English ears. And, and yeah. lots of the French at the time were not educated, so they couldn't correct anything. Well, or they weren't allowed to. I mean, there's, there's another element to this, and, and that is that um, Anglos didn't often understand naming practices among French Canadians, so some people lost both their surname and their given name all in one fell sweep because the, the uh, census taker didn't understand saints' names, didn't understand deet names. There's just a whole bunch of reasons why they didn't translate very well. So, but. It's the reason why a friend of mine whose first name is Roger, birth certificate is Rezi. Rezi. Are you Z Z? Mm -hmm. But she didn't discover until he was drafted into the army. Sure, sure. Um, it, it, it's fascinating to see what happens to, to family names. And, and uh, I get calls from people all the time. In fact, there was a, a couple here recently from Texas that were doing some research. And um, the, the fam their family name had been murdered so many times that it was really almost impossible to trace it. So we literally were going from cemetery to cemetery looking at headstones trying to do a, a kind of um, tracing of the changes of the names by connecting up the peoples, the, the, the actual people themselves. Um, as, a, as a farmer, I'm trying to think about the land ownership transfer. And it's been my uh, unscientific observation around where I live that the number of farms that the original people were Anglos, or mostly Scotch or English, mm -hmm. and they were, they're now French names on these farms. Mm -hmm. So I surmise that a lot of times the uh, Anglo family was able to send the kids off to college, and 
they didn't want to come back and be farmers, but they had the hired man mm -hmm. came down from Quebec mm -hmm. and was working for his board in Rome, and he was the last guy that they had to transfer the farm to, and oftentimes they would sell the farm to the hired man on a percentage mm. of the milk check. That's, that's interesting. I, I hadn't thought about it that way, but um, certainly there is a kind of exodus off of the farms in in kind of the between the 1920s to the 1940s of Anglos and the backfilling of those farms was not always but often French Canadian. If a article in a, a local newspaper from 1937 complained, a farmer was complaining about not being able to hire good help on the farm because Americans didn't want to work on the farm, they worked <laughs> too hard. <laughs> and the only people they could get were French Canadians sorry, who were cheap and were honest people. Le plus the, the real change. problem was that they couldn't, really? they couldn't stay any more than six months. Yeah. So they had, they were all transferring. They were having to, sh to constantly be rotated. And, and so and so the, the immigration laws allowed a farmer to, or a person to, I guess, sign for someone to come down permanently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th was, I, I think. That was a problem because once the guy uh, got a permanent visa to be here, he'd go down to Massachusetts and get a job. <laughs> oh, okay, I hadn't heard that part. But that's certainly how my husband's family ended up coming, is through sponsorship of that kind. Thank you so much. You're welcome.